Okay, so uh, our last talk of the day um, is an invited talk, and John Bars will tell us about Petronets. Great, thanks very much. So I've done a lot of stuff with Petronets, most of which uh, I figured you folks would not be particularly interested in. So instead of giving a talk about what I'm interested in, I attempted to dream up a talk that you're interested in. Unfortunately, I mainly know things about what I'm interested in. So, <laughs> so this may not be like a very virtuosic, impressive talk, but but hopefully you'll uh, at least understand it uh, and, and maybe have some things to say about it. So, so chemists like to use chemical reaction networks to describe uh, chemical processes. And I'm sure if you've studied any chemistry, you've seen some examples of these things. Um, you, what you might not have known is that uh, there's like a serious mathematical industry of studying chemical reaction networks. So what chemists will often do is assign a positive real number to each uh, one of these arrows here saying rough, I don't want to get too technical, but sort of saying how, like, how much that reaction occurs, how rapidly or eagerly that reaction occurs. And then from that extra information, you can write down a set of differential equations that describe the time evolution of the amount of each chemical. It's called the rate equation. And so they've proved lots of amazing theorems about uh, the solutions, the qualitative behavior of solutions of the rate equation, some of which have these, many of which have hypotheses that just depend on the topology of the chemical reaction network itself. I mean, in this particular case, the topology is just two dots and two edges, but not very uh, thrilling, but you can imagine very complicated chemical reaction networks that give you more interesting graphs, and they have a lot of nice results about that. So that's more like the kind of stuff that I think about. Uh, but there are lots of other angles to this story. Um, well, for starters, I should say that um, it's a little bit confusing, especially to, in the mathematical point of view, when the various entities here look like they're made out of smaller parts, like, well, then they are. Water is made of H2. and two H's and an O, but what we're going to be doing with these reaction networks is going to be a bit at a more abstract level. So we're just going to call these entities things like A, B, C, and D. So the above chemical reaction network, uh, from our point of view, it might as well just be this. Uh, so the, the constituents of, of the entities A, B, C, and D are irrelevant to us. So we just think of them as like fundamental Things. So I won't say atomic entities, that's too confusing. Uh, and then also it's nice to actually give specific names to the reactions or, or transitions, like tau one and tau two, to actually think of them as entities in itself, in themselves. Uh, and so in this more abstracted way, I'll, I'll just call it a reaction network. I don't know how much I'll talk about reaction networks, but they're sort of setting the stage for what I really want to talk about, which is Petri nets. So a Petri net, it's really just another way of describing the same sort of information that's in a reaction network. It's just a different style of drawing what's going on, essentially. Um, and so it works like this. If you have that uh, reaction network with A, B, C, D, and E, and, some, and two uh, reactions, you could draw it in this other style here. So you notice that this first reaction or transition uh, has two A's, arrows from A going into it and one arrow from B going into it. So that's this 2A plus B, and then out pops a D. Oh, I, I drew it wrong. I should have drawn two arrows going from the transition to D because out pops two D's actually. And then B and C go in and E comes out. So yeah, there should be a double arrow there. I'll fix these slides later. Um, so, so you can see it's, it's a, just another way of conveying the same information. I can draw any uh, one of these kind of things and translate it back into a reaction network. It's also worth mentioning that the, 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 these edges here, <clears throat> you shouldn't think of them as having individual identities. That is, uh, when, when we think of two A's coming in here, uh, you, you, you shouldn't ask anything like, well, which one went down this edge and which one went down this edge? So, so a more, a more uh, honest notation would draw just a single arrow here labeled with the number two. 
uh, the edges don't have names, but but people often draw multiple edges like that just as a <clears throat> nice looking. Um, so here's a Petri net, an example of a very small Petri net. So I'm going to introduce this Petri net terminology for the entities. So there are a set of things called places, which before had been our different kinds of molecules. Uh, and there's a set of things called transitions, these blue boxes, which have been before our chemical reactions. And then there's a natural number of edges from each place to each transition. And again, all that really matters is that the number, not the edges don't have, there's not a set of edges. Uh, and there's a natural number of edges from each transition to each place. So that's a way to think about a, a Petri net. It's a bit more precise. I'll make it even more precise, but that's the idea. And so there's a nice huge theory of Petri nets that people have studied from many points of view, uh, some from chemistry, but also a huge amount more from our computer science and also in other fields. So the I, one thing you can do, one of many things you can do with a Petri net is sort of run it. And, and what I mean by that is you like think of it as a little machine. And what you do is you start by placing some finite number of some natural number of tokens, which are these little dots in each place. And that assignment, a, a, a map from, from uh, places to natural numbers is called a marking of your Petri net. So here you'd think of it as you have like maybe two molecules of this type A and one molecule of this type B. And then what we can do is we can play this game called the token game where we move these tokens around using the transitions. So here you, you see that it, we could like move one of these guys and one of these guys into this transition and something should pop out there. And if I do it right, yes, okay, it did it. Uh, so now so now you see we can do another move. Uh, well, there are actually two choices of what we could do next. Uh, and so I moved the one on the right over to the left and you notice it's turned into two now because there are two arrows coming here. And now you see there's something else that we could do. Uh, and I, I did that. Um, and yeah, there's even more stuff we could we could do. So there's like all sorts of questions that arise, like can 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 you determine, can you is it a decidable question whether a Petri net uh, will it, with a given marking on it will eventually halt? That is, will it reach a, a dead end state where you can't do anything any anymore? Or another question is, um, given some marking on your Petri net and some other marking on your Petri net, can you do a sequence of these transitions to carry the first marking over to the second marking? That's called the reachability problem. And I, I will talk a bit more about later on. Uh, so it's a very simple sort of model of computation that's uh, very popular and very interesting. But what I'm mainly going to be doing is uh, showing you how to get various interesting mathematical structures starting from a Petri net that reveal various things about it. Okay, so even more mathematically, what a Petri net is, <clears throat> is it's a set S for places. I can't call that set P because P stands for Petri, unfortunately. Uh, but if you know German, S is for Stellen, which means places. So there, uh -huh. and then T is for transition. It's really nice to have letters that you know match the first letter of the name of the thing that you're uh, talking about, so you can remember it. And so here, sometimes you have to learn some extra languages to do that. Uh, and then, and then every, uh, and then here, N bracket of S means the set of formal finite sums of elements of S or markings of S. So ways of labeling each uh, uh, place with a natural number, but where the total of all those natural numbers is finite. Uh, that last proviso is unnecessary when S and T are finite. And I'll mainly talk about the case when S and T are finite, but, but you can imagine them being infinite as well. And then every transition has a source and a target, which is one of these markings, meaning every transition has uh, some uh, bunch of things coming into it and some bunch of things going out of it. Um, we can be a little more 
mathematical skill about this, what this n bracket of s thing. So the point is that um, there's a, a functor from sets to commutative monoids. We can take the free commutative monoid on a, on a set, which means you take formal finite sums of uh, elements of that set, and then you it becomes a commutative monoid in an obvious sort of way. Uh, so that's this free functor here, J. And then there's a forgetful functor that's even more obvious. Every commutative monoid has an underlying set. And so if you want to think of N of S as a set here, what you're really doing is you're, you're, you're going around the loop. You're taking the free uh, commutative monoid and then taking the underlying set of that so that you can maintain your categorical purity here. And, and T and N of S are both sets. And then S and T are just functions between those sets. Um, so, so that's what a Petri net is. So now I said I was going to build some various things out of Petri nets. And one really nice thing is that you can build a category out of a Petri net where the objects are markings. And then the morphisms are you do by doing sequences of transition. So it's a very natural notion of, of a morphism as a kind of process. So don't, you know, sometimes you think of morphisms as maps from one mathematical gadget to another gadget, like a homomorphism between groups. But there's this whole other use of category theory where you think of a morphism as like a, for example, a step in a proof or a path in a space where you think of a morphism as actually you know, going from somewhere to somewhere else. And so, so that's what we're sort of doing here. Now, the kind of category we're getting is actually much better than just any old category. It's a symmetric monoidal category, meaning that you can uh, <clears throat> add uh, things or tensor things. This is the more abstract way to think of it. And here, tensoring the objects is just adding markings. So if I have some marking and some other marking, I can just add them. And, and that corresponds to the same. So, so when, when we have that plus sign back in our chemical reaction uh, network, like you know C plus 2HDO, that plus is the symmetric monoidal structure. It's, the, it's, it's adding, uh, the, adding some markings to get a new marking. Uh, and so a symmetric monoidal category is a type of category where you have a nice tensor product that's commutative up to isomorphism. And, and here, the way we're getting the morphisms out of in our category is really both by uh, composing or composing transitions, but also by tensoring them. So, so we're, we're generating it in that sense. But, but the interesting thing is that we're getting a specific kind of symmetric monoidal category here that's much more strict than, than normal. And I, so I will explain it in more detail uh, well, in some kind of more detail than, than, than just the general concept of symmetric monoidal category. It's a weird thing in a way. It's a commutative monoidal category. So, so like when you learn about symmetric monoidal categories, the kind of things people tell you is like, well, you can take the Cartesian products of sets, and that's sort of commutative because S times T is isomorphic to T times S, but don't think of them as equal. They're not equal because you get like in serious trouble if you think of them as, as being equal, unless you're like really sneaky. Uh, and, but, but in a commutative monoidal category, you have this tensor product, which is actually completely uh, commutative work. So, so, so you know, all that stuff about isomorphisms is sort of, is overkill then. It's just actually an equation. So, well, this definition, I guess, will only be pleasant if you like category theory already, but, but, but everyone should. Um, so, so, so see, you can talk about commutative monoids in another category. So for example, if you, if you like monoids, you can talk about monoids in topological spaces or topological monoids. It's a topological space with an operation that's associated in a unit. And so you could talk about commutative monoids in CAT. So this is getting a little self-referential here, but what it means is you're, you've got a category with a multiplication. So I'm doing commutative monoids in CAT. So it's a category with a commutative and associative multiplication that I'm writing as 
tensor here because that's the usual notation for it when you're uh, <clears throat> talking about symmetric monoidal categories. But here it's just going to be this addition of markings, at least as far as the objects go. And so that's just called plus. And then, and then a unit object, a unit for that. So that's the general concept of a commutative monoidal category. Um, so it's just a category with a binary operation, i.e. A, a functor that's commutative and associative and a unit for that. Um, but in the case, well, but if you happen to know about symmetric monoidal categories already, then this is like an incredibly uh, simplified version of those because in a symmetric monoidal category, you have these isomorphisms for commutativity called gradings, and you have these isomorphisms for associativity called associators, and you have these uh, isomorphisms for the left and the right unit law called unitors. And so what, but the kind that I'm talking about is just the kind where, where all those are just identity morphisms. So all those laws are just equations. So you don't need to, so, so it's sort of overkill to learn about symmetric monoidal categories if that's what, if this is the kind you care about. Um, this kind of commutative monoidal category is rare enough that you don't usually read about them when you're learning about symmetric monoidal categories. But, but Petri nets give examples of commutative monoidal categories. So any Petri net P, see now I get to use the letter P, uh, is a commutative monoidal category, FP, meaning like the free commutative monoidal category on P. And for roughly speaking, the way it works is the objects are just going to be the markings of your Petri net. And then the morphisms you get from the transitions of, wow, I blew it though, huh? So much for that. So the transitions of P, uh, which are elements of this set T, I guess. Yeah, maybe that was okay. Uh, and you generate them by all the operations you've got. You can compose and you can tensor them. But here we're freely forming it. So you just freely form all those, but then subject to the laws of the commutative monoidal category. So it's the free commutative monoidal category on the Petri net. And so basically the morphisms in it are what you really care about. Those are the processes that you can do using the transitions in your Petri net. So if you're studying chemistry, those are just like all the possible ways you can turn a bunch of chemicals into another bunch of chemicals using the chemical reactions that you have at hand. Uh, so, so to make this uh, to make this idea of freeness into like a, a rigorous thing, we want to think about adjoint functors because what we do when we really want to say that this functor is creating some new thing really from some old things, we want to say that this functor is a left adjoint Meaning that, that well, for example, if there's a right adjoint going backwards, which is the corresponding forgetful functor. Uh, and so there's a theorem that, that indeed that is what's going on here. So to be able to state that, you've got to have some categories around. Well, there's a category of Petri nets where the objects are Petri nets, and the morphisms are just maps that sort of do the obvious thing. So it's a function sending transitions to transitions, another function sending. Uh, places to places, and then, then you're able to write down some diagrams uh, and involving your source and target uh, maps. Remember, every transition has a source and a target, and we want we, these functions here to preserve the source and target maps. And here you'll notice we're using the fact that this n thing here is a functor. So, uh, so we not only have this underlying set of the free commutative monoid on S that we get from any set S, but also for every function, we get a map from that thing to that. So, so this, is, this is sort of like the definition of a, a map between directed graphs where, a, where it should send edges to edges in a way that preserves the source and target of each edge. But here the source and target of each transition is not a single Entity, it, it, it's one of these formal linear combinations of, of uh, places. So, so there's this category of Petri nets. And so, concretely, like here's an example of what a morphism of Petri nets might look like. So, here everything on top is getting mapped to something below it. So, th these two uh, places here get it mapped to that place. 
uh, this top transition and the bottom transition are both getting mapped to this one here. Okay, I mean, that's the way I want to do it. And this one, this uh, place here is getting mapped to this. So, so that we're, we've seen that this morphism can be like two to one, both on these places and on these transitions, it's one to one here. But then also you can, what about all this stuff? Well, this is just stuff that's not in the in the range of this map. So there's nothing that's getting mapped to this guy down here. Uh, so, so it's a pretty simple pictorially visual uh, kind of concept of a map between petri nets. Um, and then there's also a category of commutative monoidal categories. So you've got the objects of those things, and then the morphisms are just maps that preserve everything. So they would be called uh, strict monoidal functors. So they're functors, but they also preserve the tensor product operation and they preserve it on the nose. Um, so then the theorem, which my student Jade Master proved, is that there are adjoint functors uh, between petri nets and commutative monoidal categories. So you can really generate a commutative monoidal category from a petri net, but that functor as a right adjoint going from commutative monoidal categories down to petri nets. <clears throat> this sounds sort of formal, and it, well, it is in some sense, but it's actually harder than, than I expected when, when, we, when we set out. And the, it's, it's a funny, uh, funny thing. We, we actually, we, I mean, we knew what F should be. So it's supposed to be like the easy thing is to figure out what the, the right adjoints should be. Uh, but it turns out we found something that was sort of, our first guess, which we spent like a few weeks on was screwed up. So, so you know that the definition of adjoint functors is something like, um, it involves this kind of isomorphism that if you've got, I'm not sure I'm using the same letters here. That if you've got something in the first category and something in the second category, that these two sets of, of maps or morphisms are naturally isomorphic. So it turns out we, we like made a guess as to what the right adjoint should be. And we showed that there was an isomorphism between these two sets. And usually by the time you get to that point, it's you're like you're there. You just need to check that this is a natural isomorphism. And usually if you're, if it looks natural in some sort of intuitive way, then it actually is natural in the strict technical sense of category. But it turns out that although we got this isomorphism, it wasn't natural in the technical sense. So then I learned at that point, right then, that in addition to the concept of right adjoint, there's also a concept of wrong adjoint. <laughs> so, so we had actually. <laughs> and then with help from Mike Shulman, we found the right adjoint. There was a different subtle order of seeming. Um, uh, and so Jade wrote up the proof proof of that in a more general context in a separate paper it will turn out to be pretty long. We had written a joint sort of I don't want to tell you. <laughs> it's, it's sort of complicated. It's sort of complicated. Yeah. Um be the favor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not the direction. Yeah. So okay. So so from a petri net, you can get this commutative monoidal category. Um, but, but there are lots of things you can do with that ca category to sort of water it down in various appealing ways. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, one thing you can do to any category is you can turn it into a pre-ordered set. You can just say that I'll take my set of objects and I'll put the find this uh, pre-order on it where I will say that X is less than or equal to Y whenever there's a morphism from X to Y. So that's basically saying, I don't care how you get from X to Y, I just want to know whether you can get from X to Y and then water down your category to a pre-ordered set. Now, a pre-ordered set's a little bit 
different than a partially ordered set, but we can go further. We can turn this pre-order, any pre-ordered set actually into a partially ordered set, a post set for short, by saying, well, <clears throat> if I if X is less than or equal to Y and Y is less than or equal to X, I'm gonna identify those. So you can do a further massage process where you identify uh, two, 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 two things whenever they're both less than or equal to each other. Uh, so then you get a partially ordered set, um, post set. And then you can go all out, like if you just wanna go wild, you can, you can turn a post set into a mere set by saying, I, I don't care about any of that fancy stuff. I'm just gonna say X is equal to Y whenever X is less than or equal to Y or Y is less than or equal to X. Of course, to, to do that, you have to close that funny relation, which is uh, reflexive and symmetric, but not transitive. You have to close it under transitivity to decide, you know, to, to, to get a, an equivalence relation that you can then uh, <clears throat> decree X to be equal to Y when that equivalence relation holds. So that's just sort of saying, can I, I'm gonna say X is equal to Y if I can get from X to Y by some kind of zigzag process where either I can get from X to something or I can get from something to X and I can keep zigzagging back and forth like that and get from X to Y. So it's a more dramatic uh, simplification process. So so we can take a category and then we can like turn it into a post set and then we can do it further crush it down and turn it into a mere set. And so all those uh, processes, they're actually functors and they're functors that are all left adjoint functors uh, going from cat, which I think of as the category of small categories and functors between them to preord. So that's uh, preordered sets and order preserving maps to post set partially ordered sets and order preserving maps and down to set, the category of sets and functions. All of these are left adjoints. If you're used to thinking of left adjoints as, as three uh, things, like a three group on a set, this doesn't have the, quite the same feel as that. You wouldn't normally say like, take the free set on a post set, uh, but, but that's because sometimes, well, it's because the concept of freedom, as you know, is very relative. So like when you're in jail, right, you're free to do whatever you want in this 10 foot by 10 foot <laughs> cell. And, and so that's sort of how, how we're like, we're, we're freely throwing in wads of equations when, uh, when, we're going, when we're doing this process, but freely throwing in equations has sort of have, doesn't feel so, it's, it's a different kind of freedom than when you're really generating new elements of the set. So it, it feels funny, but these are all left adjoints. And you can check. And there's nothing fishy about the right adjoints here. I mean, the right adjoints are just fairly obvious uh, things. Okay, so we've got those. They're all left adjoints. Now left adjoints, sort of by a simple theorem, they preserve all co-limits. So they preserve co-products. But in fact, these particular left adjoints are a little bit better than average. They also preserve products, which you don't always have when you have left adjoints. So because they preserve products, and because this idea of commutative monoid is defined using products, uh, they actually they actually all preserve commutative monoid objects. That is, they send commutative monoid objects. Uh, in here, to commutative ob monoid objects in here, to here, to here. This first one, uh, um, this first one we already, we already talked about, but, the, but I'm saying that these three guys here, uh, because they preserve products, they, they give you these three guys here, which I'm gonna use the same letters for. So in other words, you can take a Petri net, you can turn it into a commutative monoidal category, which is this nice appealing uh, category with the objects or markings, and of course, this ones are a series of transitions or chemical reactions. But then you can just uh, water that down. Whoop, you can water that down to a commutative monoid that has a pre order on it, compatible with a commutative monoid structure, or a post set of the commutative monoid where the multiplication is compatible with a post set structure, or just a commutative monoid. In the category of sets, just like cumulative monoids. Um, 
So let's look at a bit at what this actually does. Okay, so 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 I can start with a Petri net, and then I can form this commutative monoidal category on it, and then I can turn this form this commutative monoidal commutative monoid in pre-orders. Uh, and so what is that thing? Okay, so it's elements are the markings of P still, but we're saying that X is less than or equal to Y. One marking is less than or equal to another one. If you if Y is so-called reachable from X, that is, if there's a morphism uh, in your category from X to Y, or in other words, you can get from X to Y through some series of transitions in this token game. So here, for example, this marking is less than or equal to this one because we can move these two little dots, uh, these two tokens from the left to the right. But in fact, notice you can move these two dots uh, from here to here in several different ways. And so when we just say less than or equal to, we're saying, I don't care about that. I just care about whether you can do it or not. So just, to, just as a little question, so like how many different morphisms are there from this guy to this guy? In other words, how many different different ways are there to go from here to here? That's sort of a hard question because I, I didn't tell you it's an extreme amount of detail exactly how you get the commutative monoidal category from the Petri head. Now I'm asking you questions about that. But well, you could like give me, there are like a few reasonably good guess answers. So so what, what was that? Five. Five? Wow, well, that's much higher than I expected. I was say four. Four, okay. Three, three, well, three. three yeah. okay. You got here two, one, zero. <laughs> <laughs> Negative one? Yeah. So, um, so I did yeah, so I, I happen to know that the answer is three, although four would have also been a pretty appealing answer. So right, I could because each dot, each little dot here has a choice about whether it goes this way or this way. So you might think, okay, that's each two choices, two things, each making two choices, two times two is four. But the thing is that because of the rules of a commutative monoidal category, it turns out it doesn't matter whether first this guy goes here and then this guy goes down here or the other way around. It also doesn't matter which of these two guys is which. Remember, it's not like this guy has a name and this guy has a name. This, these dots are just an indication for the number, the mark from the number two. I mean, I could have just written the two in that circle there. Uh, so basically, the three different morphisms are uh, basically they, they, they both go over, they both go under, or one goes over and one goes under, but they don't have names. So you don't know which one went over and which one went under. So there are three. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, especially if you taught all the, the rules that you need to play the game. Uh, but yeah, it's, there are three. But anyway, when we formed this commutative monoidal pre-order, we were just saying, forget about all that stuff. We just want to know, can we get from here to there? And the answer is yes. So the reachability problem is what we're talking about here. The reachability problem is asking us, to, can you decide if one marking is less than or equal to another marking? Uh, so that, that sometimes is somewhat practical. So for example, chemists are very interested in knowing if I know how to do a bunch of chemical reactions, can I turn some bunch of chemicals into another bunch of chemicals? So like one question is, if I have these chemical reactions, can I turn this bunch of stuff into this bunch of stuff? And you see that like you can't always instantly tell, right? I mean, uh, I think the answer for this one is yes. But, but my point is not so much whether it's yes or no, it's just that like you have to struggle to, uh, to figure it out, even in a sort of small, medium-sized problem like this. Um, but it turns out that this reachability problem is really hard. Now, I'm not a computer scientist. I really don't know anything about computational complexity. So I'm afraid that by saying anything about it, it will elicit all sorts of questions that I'll, I don't know the answer to. But, but this is just such a cool result, I can't resist mentioning it. So first, there's this negative result. Well, the first in history, first the first result was that it's decidable, okay? So the, the reachability problem is decidable. You can make a Turing machine that can solve the reachability problem. But then the, that's the first positive result. But then the negative result that came along, actually after quite a while, it's been improved 
this is, I'm skipping a whole long story. Uh, this is like the best known negative result, I should say, not the first negative result, it's the latest negative result, that for any algorithm that decides the reachability problem, the, the, the runtime, the worst case runtime, exceeds this function. What is that? It's a function of n, where n is the size of the problem, which is some number that you calculate by it's totaling up total number of the places in your in your uh i shouldn't say generating places the total number of places the total number of inputs and outputs of all the transitions and then the total number of sum ends in the market so it's just like a gross measure of the whole size of the problem that you're handing the person it's probably like how many symbols does it take for you to tell them what problem instance of the reachability problem you're trying to get them to solve but then this function here is this scary function it's this power tower it's a power of powers of two but so the question is how many layers that it has and it turns out that the number of layers could be enormous this number of layers you, you could pick it to be any function two to the n or two to the two to the n or two to the two to the two to the n or so on so no matter which function there you pick you build a tower of that many twos and the worst case runtime exceeds that. So this is like a pretty nasty, uh, pretty nasty, but still primitive recursive uh, function. Uh, yeah, I guess the jargon is that this type of function are called elementary functions. So this is not elementary. It's like step up after that. So it's really hard to solve, but and yet it's decidable, which is interesting to me, just mainly because the the idea of PetriNet and the uh, idea of getting a category from it is so sort of simple and fundamental. So you either think that like, oh, it's probably pretty easy to solve or else like for the word problem for groups is something you know it, you're going to get some decided. But it's somewhere sort of hovering on the brink. Uh, and then a little bit later, this, these are all like within the last decade, uh, LaRue and Schmitz came up with a, an algorithm that decides the reachability problem whose runtime is bounded by the Ackermann function, or the, the slight variance on the Ackermann function. So say an Ackermann function of n. The Ackermann function is much bigger than this function. It's ridiculously faster growing than this. It's, it's not primitive recursive. Uh, and so it, you can sort of keep doing this power trick over and over and over a trillion times, and it wouldn't be as fast as the Ackermann function. Uh, so. So, but there's a gap between these two results, so we don't, nobody knows where it lies. Um, okay, so you could you could say, well, that's too hard. I want to simplify this thing a bit more. So, well, you could you could turn your yeah. So I already went from my category to my pre-order to my post set. That step there is pretty mild, not all that big a deal. But then you can do this other thing where you say, I'm just going to impose an equation between two markings. I'm going to say they're the same to me if whatever uh, either one is reachable from the other or by transitivity, zigzags of, of reachability. So, so when we do this, what we're really doing is we're using a Petri net to present a commutative monoid. But in fact, any commutative monoid presentation that you hand me, I could express using a Petri net because I could just, uh, in my generators and relations for my presentation, I, I didn't say this right. Um, the, yeah, no, this is so, 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 so the, like if I wanted to express, if I wanted a commutative monoid that had three generators, CO2 and CO2, and one relation, I would just make a Petri net that had those places as, as the generators and stick in one transition for each relation. And that this would say that, you know, that I can get from this to this. And then when we go form this uh, commutative monoid, it would just say that they're equal. So the problem of, uh, so the problem of getting commutative monoids from Petri nets is just really sort of the same as the problem of getting commutative monoids from presentations in general. And then I started thinking, well, since I said how hard it was to solve the reachability problem, how hard is it to solve this problem? There are probably people 
in this room who have studied this for like 30 years. And I'm scared to say this, but anyway, I'll just I'll just say it. So there are probably other people who've never thought about it. So so Cardoza has proved that the word problem in any uh, fixed finitely generated commutative monoid. So you pick a finitely generated commutative monoid and then you get to pick which words you're asking are they equal. It can be solved in linear time, that is linear in the sum of the lengths of the two words that you're checking for equality. So if you pick your, your finitely presented monoid, then it's not <laughs> not so hard, it's linearly at least, uh, how hard to check whether words in there are equal. But then you could also think of it this other way where you say like, oh, what if I get to like uh, change my mind about which finitely generated commutative monoid I want, like in the previous problem, that was sort of part of the data to the problem. And then it's, then it's harder naturally, it's, but it's known somewhat, uh, quite a bit is known about exactly how much harder. So Meyer, Mayer and Meyer proved that uh, the word problem for finitely generated commutative monoids can be solved in exponential space, exponential in the sums of the length of the words being compared and the words in all the relations. So see here we're treating all of that as our input data and then we're asking, hey, are those two words equal? And in fact, it's exponential space complete. Uh, no one knows if it can be solved in exponential time, but because this thing is exponential space complete, if it can, if this problem can be solved in exponential time, then then these two complexity classes of exponential space and exponential time are equal. That's just what it means to say that it's exponential space complete. And this problem is a famous unsolved problem in computer science. So it's really hard, apparently. Um, so what, I yep. I'm really confused. I don't understand the difference between these two terms. So what, what is the what is the what is the fix finally generated? In so I I give you a finally generated commuted monoid, and then I ask you. Can you tell if this word is equal to this word? Right. And then you can and, and you can find an algorithm. Sorry, you can find an algorithm such that when I give you these two words, you'll be able to settle that question in a time that grows linearly with its length of those words. So the point is the rapid growth here is sort of not it's it's not the lengths of the words being compared, it's the problem. It's the it's the it's the total. Oh, length of the relations oh. that's the problem. So it's like you can think of it as like growing linearly with respect to the first variables, but way faster than linear with respect to this. Okay, so the difference of these two things is that the first one you assume that you've given the relations fixed ahead of time, right? And this one and the other, the second one takes the relations as a parameter, right? So yeah, exactly. Thing. Yeah, so 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 that sort of the latter part that's what makes it so hard. So when you say finitely generated, do you mean finitely presented? Oh, I meant presented. Yeah, sorry, that's sort of stupid typo. Yeah, sorry, sorry, this is stupid. I should have said this in both cases. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it's so it's known that it's exponential in exponential space, and it's also known that it can be solved in what's called doubly exponential time, which means well, it's sort of so you could accept it two to the two to the polynomial on n for any for some polynomial p. So that's that's a lot of time. <laughs> and it's known that it can't be solved in polynomial time. So these are problems that are really interesting. I'm just absolutely no, no good at any of this type of problem, but I just think it's neat that these uh, hard complexity problems arise in this subject. <clears throat> um, so there's also a left adjoint functor. This is a new left adjoint here, going from partially ordered sets to soup lattices. There, I think there's some earlier standard term for soup lattice uh, that maybe all of you like, but the, the N lab, of which I'm in some minor role, has is pushing for the term soup lattice. So I'm gonna use that uh, mainly because I forget the other term. And what it what it means, so it it's a it's a post set where all all subsets have suprema. So I guess you could you might call them what like a complete uh, join semi lattice. Yeah. Um, 
Category theorists can't abide by that because joins are actually co-limits, so it should be called co-complete. So, so I, I think that's uh, like enough to make us category theorists to make up some goofy new word like subclass. Um, but but the really important thing is not the object so much as the morphisms. The morphisms are ordinary to preserve order preserving has to preserve all those suprema. Uh, so. Um, well, you'll you'll see why I'm emphasizing that in a minute if you don't already. So, so you can the way you get this uh, soup lattice from a post set is you take all the down sets, which are the downwards closed subsets, and they're ordered by inclusion. And so you get a map of post sets that's an inclusion, sending each x to the principal down set that is the set of all things less than or equal to it. So you can think of it. You're just puffing up your your uh, your original post set to a soup lattice where each element of your original post set gets sent to this uh, particular element uh, of the uh, soup lattice. And in L of X, the, su the supremum is just the union. You take a union of a bunch of down sets as a down set. So, there's the, what I was trying to hint at here is that when you have a soup lattice, it has automatically not only the supremum of all subsets, but also the, the infima of all subsets. So what matters though, is that maps of soup lattices that preserve the supremum by definition, they don't need to preserve the infima. So that's where the asymmetry shows up. Uh, and also any, Soup lattice is Cartesian closed, meaning the operation of uh, of meets or and uh, has a right adjoint some kind of implication operation. What do I mean by that? Well, I just mean that uh, that this element of y implies e, which has the property that x uh, and y is less than or equal to z, if and only if x is less than or equal to y implies e. So, so you can think of a soup lattice as a kind of a little world of a lot of some kind of logical system. Uh, but you again, you have to be aware that maps of soup lattices don't need to preserve that uh, implication operation either. Just the soup. And there's a tensor product of soup lattices uh, such that a map from a tensor product of soup lattices is the same thing as an order preserving map from the, the ordinary product of these of their underlying post sets uh, that preserves suprema in each argument, just like an ordinary, like a tensor product of vector spaces encapsulates is a way to study you know, maps that are linear in each argument. Um, and so, so, so what's neat is that you can you can start using that tensor product to do stuff sort of like you use the tensor product in linear algebra, uh, in particular. For starters, this map from post sets to soup lattices, this free functor I was talking about, it's symmetric monoidal. So, in particular, for example, the, the, uh, the set of the free soup lattice on x times x is isomorphic to that of the x tensor, that of x prime. Um, so, what that implies then, by some abstract, easy abstract nonsense, is that it will. Because this function is symmetric monoidal, it will send commutative monoid objects in post sets with their Cartesian product to commutative monoid objects in suplat, but not with the Cartesian product, but with this uh, tensor product. So these guys, these commutative monoid objects in suplat, are called commutative unital quantals. I think I won't keep saying unital, but, but they are, but they're huge. Uh, so this is my way of re remembering what a Quant, uh, a quantal is a quantal is a monoid object in soup lattices. And I only care about the unital ones. <laughs> That's why I say that. But um, so so what, what I'm saying here is that that this chain of processes that I've been describing that keeps sending commuted, well, takes Petrinet and turns them into various commutative monoidal gizmos, goes all the way down to the commutative or across to commutative quantals. And so, so concretely, a commutative quantile is a soup lattice that has this multiplication, this commutative and associative, 
and it distributes over Suprema in each argument, and it has a unit. Um, and so when you do that from a Petri net, what is this multiplication? This multiplication is coming from the tensor product in the commutative monoidal category, which is the thing that I've been calling plus when I'm talking to you, like a campus. So the C plus O2, that's becoming the multiplication in our quantile. And the unit object for it is, is the zero marking, which is nothing, not having any anything. Um, So, so for example, we can we can see what all this nonsense amounts to in a concrete case. So here we take a little, very simple little Petri net and we turn it into this and that and that and that until finally we get a commutative quantile. And here are some things that are true in there. So we have the uh, plus operation, which was the which was the you know, tensor product in our category so that's the giving that's the multiplication be careful that's the multiplication in our quantal and, and because you can get from c plus o2 to co2 using this transition we have this inequality here uh but then we also have this uh join which is or, or and because because of how or works uh c is less than or equal to c or o2 so I will use that that other one there and then the multiplication which confusingly is the plus distributes over over all soups so it distributes over this join here so what this is way to read this might be that uh to have carbon and to have either a carbon or an oxygen molecule is the same as having two carbons or having a carbon and an oxygen molecule. So, so we are getting this number of different connectives that all have meanings, which I'll talk about in just a second, I'm almost done. Uh, and we get these other types of relations, which I think I'll skip over. Um, so the punchline and the point of all this is that the commutative quantile that we get from a Petri net is describing some kind of logic that people often call logic of resources. I think people use that phrase when they're trying to explain uh, linear logic, and and so we're sort of getting a fragment of linear logic out of out of this. So the plus has one meaning. X plus Y means you could say what your resource you're giving someone when you're giving someone X plus Y is you have an X together with a Y. So C plus O two is what you've got when you've got a carbon atom together with an oxygen molecule. But then there's this or operation which is what you have is an X or a Y. So here you have a carbon or an oxygen molecule. Um, and then you have and the, this is the, this is the um, meets operation in our, in the underlying soup lattice of our quantal. So this is what you have is both an X and a Y. <laughs> so if I tell you what you've got, it's both a carbon atom and an oxygen molecule. Well, there's no such thing as something as both of those. So, so what you've got is nothing. There's nothing like that. Um, um, so this stuff I was just talking about, I was inspired to think of it this, think about it from this paper uh, from 1990 by Engberg and Blin Wiskel, Petri Nets as Models of Linear Logic, uh, where they, do all of this stuff in sort of more of a logician's way of talking than, than my way of talking, which is more of a category here. So it's like, and they show a bunch more. They show, that, for example, that the plus operation x plus blank also has a right adjoint. And that's a kind of adjoint, which is a kind of linear logician's kind of implication denoted by a lollipop. Uh, so you have a very similar kind of a, a junction formula, but for plus now instead of and. Um, so there's a lot more I could say, but you'll be glad to know that I'm not going to say it. Okay. We have time for one question. So we can uh, maybe have more during the. Yeah, I can send off arbitrary numbers of questions, <laughs> but only for the drink. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, go ahead. Um, one of the very main questions that 
But the category of happiness, the object of happiness, and the uh, temporary just the plus. Right. So, so, the, the, so each each PetriNet gives you a category in which the tensor product consists of the plus. So now you're talking about the category of PetriNets. Tensor PetriNet is the object of the mark. The mark. The mark of the uh, you're suffering from the kind of level flipping, which is what category theorists delight. <laughs> yeah, that's our trade. So, so, uh, so every so th there are two things, and you seem to be blending them. So, there's a category of petri nets where the objects are petri nets and the morphisms are maps between petri nets. That's one thing. And then there's this other thing that each petri, each individual petri net gives you a category where the objects are markings and the morphisms are. Yeah, that's for the tensor is just the plus. The tensor is just the plus. Yeah. The correct plus has to be between one marking and another marking. Right. Well, it should not you take two markings and you plus them and you get a new marking. Yeah. Exactly. So the plus is supposed to be between two markings. I wouldn't say between, but combining it's, 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 it's an operation that takes two markings and gives them one. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Not places. Not places. But in your last slides, you're adding places. So that's what I was confused. In your in your uh, I don't want to run back to the last place, the last slide, but but the but but one key thing is that each place gives you canonically a marking that's one at that place and, and zero everywhere else. So I think of the places as special markings of that sort. Oh, with no transition. Sorry, well now I have to figure out what you're <laughs> what was it on the last slide? This slide? But the previous one, maybe. This? C plus O2. So oh, I see. C is a place and O2 is another place. I'm 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 doing this, I'm doing this thing where I'm identifying places with markings that are zero everywhere except that one place. So if I have just nothing except one carbon, then I'm denoting that as C. And all this stuff is happening in the in the quantal here. So actually, the, the things in the quantal are actually downsets of none. And, and so I'm again committing a kind of sin. I'm identifying uh, a particular uh, place with the downset that it generates. But yeah, but in, yeah, so. So this piece is the pentamix that we have with just one mark, one, one uh, token in the C set. You get us, yeah, we've got this particular Petri net, that one there. And then we all these things I'm writing here are different elements in the quantal coming from that. And 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 they are downsets in the quantal, they're downsets of markings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of yeah. Maybe you realize how many slippery things I was doing. <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank. The organizers for this conference. By the way, I forgot to do that at the beginning, but thank them.